Correct. Okay, so metabolism as a term is gonna to refer to the, all, every chemical reaction in the cell, whether that's making bonds or breaking bonds, anything that involves any sort of chemical change in the cell, that's metabolism. It doesn't, that doesn't have to be only about, you know, how your body processes your carbs or something like that. That's not even what that term really refers to. It's about the chemical reactions behind that, okay? So anabolism and catabolism are the two things that, you know, uh, fall under metabolism. You can essentially sort your reactions into making bonds or breaking bonds, right? And that makes sense. So making bonds are gonna be building molecules and then breaking bonds, we're gonna be well, you know, taking them apart because there's energy in bonds between atoms. And so we can actually harness the energy whenever we break those bonds. So anabolism, building the molecules, catabolism, uh, releasing the energy. The way I always remember this is because I feel like cats, cats are destructive and will tear things apart. So I think of catabolism being like that, you know, cats are gonna destroy, we're gonna be breaking the bond, okay? Releasing the energy from those bonds breaking. Okay. Um, so yeah, whenever we are breaking those bonds and uh, releasing energy, that can be um, collected in the form of ATP or can be released as heat, which is why our bodies give off heat, literally, is whenever we are um, not harnessing that energy for ATP. If you can't, literally can't because of the chemical aspect of it, then it'll get released as heat when we break those bonds. Catalysts, we kind of talked about this a little bit when we introduced the concept of an enzyme, but we're gonna get into a little bit of the details of it today. Catalysts are anything that help uh, chemical reaction speed up, you know, to work more efficiently, basically. Um, they overcome activation energy. So if you guys remember from chemistry, activation energy is the energy that has to be put into that reaction to allow it to happen. So enzymes help um, overcome that just on their own. So they'll increase thermal energy with heating. Um, that increases the velocity of the molecules. That can help increase the rate of the reaction. And they can increase concentration of reactants. Um, that can affect that as well. And then this catalyst addition of the enzymes just themselves can help to speed up the reaction because they can get involved in the process of the reaction. So there's a lot of things that can be added into a reaction um, that can be helpful in overcoming that activation energy. So adding heat to speed up the molecules, uh, at, you know, increase of reactants, and then um, adding catalysts to help just move everything faster. All right, enzymes. The ones that we talk about the most as far as catalysts go, obviously in biology, the most important catalysts that we care about are gonna be our enzymes. I'll repeat this again so that you guys don't forget it. Maybe one of these days will actually stick in your head, but um, enzymes, all of them are proteins, okay? Every single enzyme, it's a protein. And if something ends in ACE, like ligase or polymerase or something like that, ACE at the end, that's an enzyme. Okay. So it's an enzyme. So therefore, it has to be a protein. It has ACE. You already know what that is. All right. Uh, so yeah, is there anything in here I care about that's different? Okay. So the top part, most of them are composed of protein. The ones that you are going to care about in this class, protein. That's all I want you guys to worry about. Okay. Um, and it may require cofactors. Um, that means something that has to bind with it in order for it to do its job. For example, you think of hemoglobin. Can hemoglobin do its job of carrying, you know, oxygen molecules around without iron there? No, it has to have iron. That's part of what's going on there, right? So iron it would be a cofactor for that particular molecule. Um, for the enzymes, they have similar things going on. Okay? They might need a metallic ion. They might need an organic molecule like a vitamin. Vitamins, if you need a vitamin, that's usually what vitamins are for, to act as cofactors for enzymes. Usually. Um, okay, so enzymes usually have an active site. That active site is wherever we have our substrate that we're actually acting on. So you're an enzyme and you're gonna hold on to your substrate and that your substrate binds into your active site. Okay, so that's basically the idea of how that's gonna work. Um, those are the terms that we're gonna be using quite a bit of as we go through this. Um, 
yeah, obviously the enzymes are going to be larger than their substrates. I feel like that's already a given, but in case it isn't, they're going to be much larger, usually quite a bit larger. Um, they'll have like a little pocket that what they're acting on will fit into. They don't ever become integrated into the product, so they're not going to be changed permanently during the reaction. Um, they can be recycled as a result of that. Okay, So um, we don't need a ton of them because they can just be reused. Just, things just have to wait for their turn to be processed by the enzyme. Um, they're, of course, going to be greatly affected by temperature and pH. These are molecules that rely heavily on their shape. These proteins, their shape is extremely important in their ability to function and to operate and to work on the substrate that they are acting on. So we need to maintain that, that shape. And temperature and pH, of course, can denature any protein. So um, and this can be re regulated by feedback and genetic mechanisms. We'll kind of talk about that later. But in, in, in short... What that oil be getting at is like if you your enzyme is taking you know your substrate and like breaking it in half. If you end up having too much that are broken in half, our product basically, um, then those can have a relay mechanism to basically tell the enzyme to stop making it. Right? We talked a little bit about that with like operons and how those function. It's a similar concept, but yeah, there's terms and stuff we're going to talk about uh, related to it. So we have two different kinds of enzymes, the simple ones that are just protein enzymes by themselves. And then we have the conjugated ones. These are ones that have some sort of non-protein molecule. It can be organic molecule, but it won't be another protein. Okay, So those will be conjugated. When we have conjugated enzymes, which I'm not going to lie, that's probably most enzymes. Okay, But conjugated enzymes, when you have the functioning structure of them, that's called the holoenzyme. Yeah, and I, I think of like holodeck, that's what it always reminds me of. But holo, you can also think of whole, like that's the whole functioning enzyme, okay? And then we have the apoenzyme and the cofactor that create the holoenzyme. So the apoenzyme kind of gives it away. That's the enzyme portion without the cofactor. And a cofactor is any non-protein portion that is required for that holoenzyme to do its job to, to make it an actual holoenzyme. So it can be an organic molecule, or it can be inorganic, like the metallic ions that like we talked about with iron. Um, if it's organic, we will call it a coenzyme. And uh, vitamins, by the way, like vitamin C or vitamin uh, D or whatever vitamin, B12, those are organic molecules. So those fall into coenzyme. All right, so you can see here in these pictures that we have depiction of the coenzyme, uh, bound onto the apoenzyme to create. Why is this? Did I not click? Hold on, really quick. I hate this so much every time. This is not as bad as the one in 100. That one in 100 is worse. Okay. All right. So we have the. Uh, enzyme in the purple. So this is this would be the APO enzyme in purple. Just to be clear. And then whatever cofactor. So the orange or whatever. And you might even need more than one. So in this case, this is an example of the whole enzyme is has a coenzyme and a metallic cofactor. You can have a lot of crap going on with these guys basically is what I'm saying. But um, without those, the coenzyme and the metallic cofactor that would be binding there, um, this thing won't even be able to bind to a sub substrate because a lot of times that'll cause the whole enzyme to change its shape. And without that shape, it can't bind to its target substrate. So um, they won't even function at all without a lot of the time. So let's get into the active site where your substrate binds. Your substrate, literally just the thing that you're acting on, okay? Um, it's gonna fit into a little groove that is specifically shaped for that substrate or ones that are similarly shaped, you know. Um, a lot of times the shape is more important. Um, the chemical structure, the outside, whether it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic, and all of that junk can have a role in it as well. So all of that has to interact appropriately for the enzyme to do its job on a thing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, remember, this is going to come back to that whole concept that we had about uh, the levels of structure of the protein. That primary is the amino acid sequence. Secondary, how you get the initial shape of the um, 
alpha helices or the beta sheets basically from, like I said, initial interactions of your amino acids. Then the tertiary structure, the tertiary structure is gonna be interactions of those structures with one another. A lot of times forming um, like disulfide bonds, which are covalent bonds that can help uh, be important into the structure. So that would be your polypeptide. If you made your like sequence that you got from your mRNA, that one product that you have, that would be at the tertiary level. Now may maybe a few of those same structures or a few of that plus other similar structures come together to make an actual functioning enzyme. Whenever we have everything together that we need in order to function, that's the quaternary. So that could be more than one polypeptide kind of interacting together. So it's just reiterating what we kind of learned about the structure of proteins. And uh, this is just showing us how our enzyme can interact with certain substrates and whether it's chemical interactions or actual literal shape, and shape is very important here, but our substrate fits into its little active site. That is the, the active site. Um, and it's very specific. So this guy was shaped a little different, chemical structure a little different, it's not gonna fit. Um, but we, when we have the correct substrate and we have all of our cofactors and everything, we are our holo enzyme, um, proper functioning whole enzyme. Uh, we can, you know, get our products from our substrate or substrates. Now here it's showing us our substrate getting cleaved into two parts. I even talked about my substrate getting broken into two parts. But you can also take two parts, and those would be different substrates. But the enzyme can help bring them together and create a bond too. It's just easier to depict this. I feel like. Okay, so let's talk about the metallic cofactors first. We know in our diet, we have to have iron, copper, magnesium, manganese, zinc, cobalt, selenium, all these different things in very tiny amounts, right? Our trace elements that are present in our diet, almost always associated with the function of an enzyme. They're almost always going to be um, metallic uh, cofactors involved in enzyme function. So they can actually, here's the thing too. The coenzymes or the co metallic cofactors, either one, can participate directly in the chemical reactions itself. Um, so we're sparing the, the actual apoenzyme, the protein portion, but the metallic ions, those guys can get used up. The vitamins, those guys can get used up during this whole thing. But the main, you know, big daddy protein is going to be maintained regardless. All right. So next we have the coenzymes. Again, same thing. They're just cofactors, but just organic. So they're all cofactors. Cofactors can be broken up into essentially the metallic, non-organic, inorganic, we would say. And then the second category of the organ. Right? So these are the organic ones, the coenzymes. Um, they will help remove chemical groups from one substrate and add it to another substrate, like a phosphate transfer. Okay. If I have ATP and I tell you the ATP drives, works as our energy molecule in the cell, Removing that phosphate group on there releases energy, but that could help power moving that phosphate onto something else. Then when it has that phosphate attached onto it, it changes its shape, and now it can do a different thing. Or now it has a negative charge, so now it can do a different thing. That stuff is incredibly important in the cell. When we start adding all of these concepts up together, um, let's not forget that this is like the thing happening in the cell. There's you know just millions of different reactions going on in the cell all at once. And they're all going to be interacting with one another typically um, and rely on one another and everything. So it's big picture stuff. Um, so each enzyme um, can interact with everything very specifically. And it's kind of interesting how specific it can be, honestly, almost like antibodies, but whatever. So uh, vitamins, often an important component or an actual uh, coenzyme. They can be by themselves or they can be part of a coenzyme. But if it's organic, you know. All right, so we have all these enzymes. When you have your holo enzyme, and what to remember, it's your protein portion, apoenzyme, and then your cofactor if you need one. So if you need one um, or not, there's six classes of enzymes as far as what kind of functions it's gonna be able to perform. These are the six, and you do need to know all six, okay? Um, I will say that typically on my example unit two, in my test bank, I have, I refer to almost, I'd say four of them, because some of these I just don't care about that much. Isomerase, who cares? But it's just, um, it, yeah, so some of these I don't care as much about, but four of these are biggies. And I feel like they're the ones that we talk about the most in class anyways. And you might not think that we've talked about an oxidoreductase yet, but get ready 
because today's the day, guys. Today's the day, okay? So if you guys remember about redox reactions, anybody remember about redox reaction to chemistry? Um, reduction, oxidation, that sort of stuff, electron exchange, right? That's what pretty much everything in your metabolism depends on, okay? So we're gonna talk about that. Oxidoreductase is probably the most important one. A version of oxidoreductase will be uh, hydrog like dehydrogenase is hydrogenase. Because remember, hydrogens are protons, so they're still gonna be dealing with electron exchange or, or that. Um, then we have transferases, transferring a group from one substrate to another, like we were talking about with that phosphate. Um, hydrolases, hydrolases, these are going to be uh, cleaving bonds on molecules with addition of water. Um, and then we have lyases, which have to do with double bonds. I'm I have to teach you about it, but don't care about it, okay? Isomerase, it has to deal with changing the uh, structure of the chemical molecule. Also don't care about it, but you know, you guys know what an isomer is. It's just a different you know, shape of the same molecule. So it helps with that if you're interested. But I really need you to know those three plus, of course, I need you to know a ligase, right? We've already talked about how important DNA ligase is in joining DNA fragments because having Okazaki fragments just hanging out on their own, your cell does can't do anything with that. They have to be sealed back together in order for us to be able to read those genes and make mRNA appropriately and da 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 da, da. So our DNA ligase is very important for that. Um, so that's one example of a ligase. So definitely those four, those are the four I would be aware of. Those are the ones I ask questions about on the exam, okay? You might get the question about oxidoreductase and your buddy might get the ligase question, but it's gonna be there, okay? Um, I, yeah, I like these questions because just because we use this so much in the class. Uh, right, so the ligase, so I'm just sitting here saying the word and not actually talking about what they are. So they are um, gonna be formation of bonds. You're gonna need, to form a bond, you have to put in energy. So that shouldn't be anything you know new. We're building things. If I was gonna stand here and build you know, a tower of Jenga or whatever for us to play Jenga, um, I have to put energy into that, right? Anytime you're building anything simple or you know, complex. You need to put energy into it. So of course we're forming bonds. So we need ATP and we're going to remove water in the process. Look at that. Okay. Hydrolases and ligases often, I don't want to say opposites, but they can work in tandem at, at you know, different ends of the, what's going on in the cell. So be aware of that. I don't usually ask about that specifically, but I just think it helps with knowing what's going on. Okay. Yay. Oxidation and reduction. Um, did you guys, I don't know if you guys in chemistry learned any like little acronym for remembering what oxidation is or what reduction is. Sometimes they teach Leo says GER and sometimes they teach oil rig. I don't know if you guys learned either of those. I learned Leo says GER because Leo the lion says GER. So uh, what Leo says GER. So it's always going to be three letters, no matter if it's oil rig or Leo GER. Okay. Loss of electrons, you know what that means, right? Um, means oxidized. Gain of electrons means reduced. I literally have to write this down. When I'm, if I were to take the test that I would be giving you guys, I would have to write this on my scratch paper so that my mind doesn't have to process thinking about it in the question. I highly recommend you do the same thing. If I say, I give the example of sodium and chloride, which we talked about in ionic bonds, right? How sodium donates its electron to chlorine. Sodium is then positive, chlorine is then negative. That's part of ionization in ionic bonds, right? You know about that concept. But when sodium donates its electron to chlorine, it loses its electron, so it is oxidized, okay? And then chlorine got an electron, it gained an electron, so it is reduced. So we could even look at it that way. Um, but if I ask a question about that on the test, it's easier to just look at Leo or Gerd and say, was this losing electron? I feel like that's easy. I rely on that so heavily that I can't just think about it just automatically. I'm being completely honest here. So. If you uh, need something like that, that's fine. If you guys like that one, there's also the other one is oil 
Rig, which is the same exact concept, but maybe a little bit easier for you to remember. I just learned Leo Gur from high school, like AP Chem. So um, oxidized is loss. Reduced or reduction is gain. So same thing. It's just a different wording whatever's easier for you, okay? Obviously the R's and G versus the O's and L's, that's what's important in the whole thing. Um, so if you need to write out both even, you could just see automatically that, okay, reduction is dealing with gaining electrons just by looking at it, right? So that's how I remember that, um, whatever works for you. The book teaches about oil rig. I learned it, Leo says, but well, that was like in the nineties, so whatever. Uh, yeah, so oxidation, loss of electrons, in case you haven't figured that out, and in case you don't remember, oxidation deals with losing your electrons for whatever reason. Any compound that lost its electrons, like sodium in our example, is oxidized, right? I am not, okay, well, let's just do reduction first. Gain of electrons is reduction. Anything that has gained an electron, like chlorine in our example, is reduced. Okay, um, I, down at the bottom, it says NAD and FAD are coenzyme carriers. Okay, great. What is, the hell does that mean? Uh, <laughs> let's just say, of electrons, uh, but that still doesn't really help. We are gonna explain this in a moment. I don't know why it is on a slide like, of course, you know, I, I usually modify the textbook slides. That's no surprise, most of the teachers do that, but um, I don't always get every little thing exactly the way I want, because I'm kind of lazy about it. But, um, you guys get it. So we're going to talk about what that means in a minute. NAD and FAD. I will never need you to remember what those stand for. Okay. I just want you to remember NAD and FAD when we get to it. Okay. Um, I also am not, I think I already deleted it out of this and you're welcome. I'm not going to ask you about reducing agents and oxidizing agents because I don't need you to be getting confused. I'm just going to leave it at that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, leave it alone. Okay, <laughs> you know, just leave it alone. Stick with Leo says Gur. You're fine. Like <laughs> you'll be covered on the exam. I promise. I won't ask about which one is the reducing agent and which one is the oxidizing agent because it gets confusing. So remember, Leo says Gur. Remember which one is oxidized and which one is reduced, and you should be fine. All right, these are not surprises either. We sort of already, you know, brought this up. Exoenzymes like our saccharobes do, you know, exuding outside of their cell. Uh, enzymes to break down usually food and then they can absorb those nutrients across the cell wall right not directly we would usually need a channel or something to help them across because only water can move across we learned about osmosis so endoenzymes these are enzymes that work inside of the cell of course there's going to be quite a lot of these as well we've already learned about a few of them dna ligase um dna polymerase um on all that sort of stuff whatever rna polymerase learned about some of them Constitutive enzymes are always there, always working. And then we have regulated enzymes that are turned on, induced, or turned off, repressed. That just sounds familiar. Uh, that's when we talked about the operons for the bacteria. Remember, operons are only for bacteria. But the concept can be applied to a lot of genes in our cells as well. It just won't be in an operon. It'll just be induced or repressed on their own. So constitutive enzymes, we just, let's see, this purple is the enzyme. Uh, whether or not you have more substrate or less substrate, they're just always gonna be in the same amount, okay? The regulated enzymes, you can turn them on and off. So now we have um, our enzyme, da, 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 just chilling, we just have a few. If you add more of your substrate you need to work on, it can induce production of more enzyme. But then, um or you might start out with a lot and then uh reduce it whenever you don't need it anymore right so that's the idea um you only have a whole lot and then when you, when you run out of the thing usually the enzyme you know, will go away and won't come back again until you need it again that's the idea with repressed ones um with inducible ones versus repressed ones that's right okay. which i don't need to get into that too much right now leave that for the operons please because i'm not going to test you about that in any other regard if I talk about reduced and repressed or reducible or repressible, I'm gonna be talking about in regard to the operons. And yeah, yeah I'm gonna test you over the operons. I hate to break it to you. Um, 
anything uh, that will help with virulence, right? Anything that helps with pathogenicity to make you sick is considered a virulence factor. That's the term for it. I know I've said it before. Again, I say it over and over again, maybe we'll remember. So some of these enzymes can function as toxins and a toxin is just something that causes damage to your tissues. This would be streptokinase, streptolysin, elastase, collagenase, lipase, penicillinase. So I'm gonna focus on these two that are circled here just because they're easier. We all kind of know what collagen is. Collagen is part of your extracellular matrix. It helps support your cells and give, you know, the tissue structure and stuff like that. Um, when or organisms like bacteria are trying to invade into your tissues, when they have this enzyme, collagenase, that enzyme, it breaks down collagen and helps it get in between your cells and get into deeper tissue. Okay. That's what collagenase does. Uh, you might be thinking, oh, geez, which one has that? Almost like all of them. <laughs> so almost all of them. This is the terrifying part about uh, microbiology. So then we have a penicillinase, which obviously that's going to break down penicillin, right? So that's a resistance gene. If you have the gene to make that enzyme, then you can break down penicillin and now you're resistant to penicillin and possibly penicillin related drugs. Anything that ends in psyllin, right? Penicillin, ampicillin, anything like that. Amoxicillin. All right, um, we already talked about how uh, chemically unstable an enzyme can be, how its shape is important, how its like chemical structure and interaction with the, the substrate is important. That all depends on um, the environment that it's in. So we maintain our pH in our cells and in our bodies specifically because of this. It's because of our proteins. So um, any disruption of that will lead to denaturation of that protein. That just means change in that structure so it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't have to be completely denatured, but anytime it's altered at all, um, that's denaturation. So um, no longer has the same shape and it can't use the active site and work on it to make the products, right? Usually heat, um, pH change of any kind, high or low. And then there are certain kinds of chemicals that do this, like just literally directly. Um, things like phenol. Phenol is very well known for that. So this non-functional enzymes block metabolic reactions and can lead to cell death. That should be obvious as well, right? So a lot of these metabolic reactions, we're trying to make ATP. If you can't make the ATP, something in that whole line is messed up, then you're screwed. Um, I don't feel like this is super exciting, but you know, leading into these metabolic pathways, because we're going to be talking about a few of them here specifically, um, but there's different ways they can take their form, whether it's cyclical, so they just feed their product just feeds back into the reaction is reused over and over again and interacting with whatever you're putting into it. Some of them are going to branch off to make nutrients. This product could make DNA. This product could be used to make um, amino acids and whatever else you get it. Yeah. Or be used to make um, ATP. And that'll make a little bit of sense whenever we get into talking about uh, aerobic respiration. But yeah, metabolic pathways. So these are some examples. We have a linear process, like we will see with glycolysis. We have a cyclical process, like we will see with the Krebs cycle. And then we have uh, branched versions, which usually has to do with making or breaking bonds, right? So if you have uh, this product, plus this product makes that product. Obviously you made bonds there. So that's gonna be dealing with making something. So amino acid synthesis, um, that's gonna be anabolism, of course. And then breaking a bond, tearing something apart, that makes you a cat, catabolism. All right, so that's the idea, what we're gonna get talking about. With your enzymes um, in that active site, where you usually would act on, let's say uh, your, your DNA, uh, polymerase, right? Normally you interact with uh, nucleotides that come in, you're going to add them on, you know, A to T and G to C and match them up and whatever, happy times, going five times to three times, everything's good. Let's say there's something that looks quite a lot like a nucleotide that we could put in there instead, but DNA uh, polymerase can't use it or act on it or anything, so it just will get stuck there, all right? You might think like, okay, but does that sort of stuff actually exist? They not only exist, but sometimes we like will intentionally design them as antivirals or something like that to target specific aspects of certain metabolic pathways. That's why some of the drugs that we take for um, viral infections or sometimes even depending on um, the antibac antibacterial antibiotics, um, those can be harmful to you 
too. So it can affect your pathways too. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that in another chapter. What chapter is? I believe that that is 12 or 13 something. I don't know, 12, that's it. okay, 12. Um, anyways, so that, if it binds at the active site and it'll shut down that enzyme, that is competitive inhibition, okay? So we're inhibiting that enzyme's function because we're binding at the site where the action is happening. It's competing with the substrate, competitive inhibition, okay? Then we have non-competitive inhibition. That would be like, uh, if I need to bind a protein and I interact with my substrate like this, but there's something else that comes around that like pulls my legs out so that, you know, suddenly now my knees are bent and I fall to the ground or something. And I have to let go of this because I have to catch myself, right? It is that sort of concept when we talk about non-competitive inhibition. It's not interacting with the actual substrate site. It's interacting with another part of the protein and causing it to change shape typically so that it can't interact that way. So what usually happens, this is usually the product of the reaction. So whenever you are making an amino acid like proline or something, um, and you're acting on these things, you're making amino acid, you're making amino acid, and you've just got all this proline building up. Too much of it builds up and it binds on, kicks out the needs of the protein, and it won't be acting on anything else to make any more proline. So that's the idea. That is non-competitive inhibition. So just remember, competitive inhibition, that inhibitor actually binds at the active site. And non-competitive inhibition, it does not bind at the active site. The site where it does bind is called the regulatory site. Like that is in gray. It's usually feedback, negative feedback. So that's what we were talking about feedback at the beginning. So here is a comparison between the two without you know somebody holding a phone and bending their knees or whatever. So uh, we have our normal substrate that will fit here typically, but now this one um, looks similar. I don't know why it does that line thing. Uh, it'll look similar. So if it binds there, that normal one wouldn't be able to bind there. So it's blocking it. That's competitive. Same spot, right? They're competing for the same spot. That's the idea. And usually they will stay there. Like they'll become almost permanently integrated. It's usually like a long-term interaction. So really like screws up the whole process. All right. So normal thing binds here. That's not going to necessarily change. If it can uh, go through its process normally, we'll make our product. We get too much product. It'll come bind on this part of the protein. The shape changes. Now this cannot bind there anymore. And so we stop making the product. You see how that's the feedback mechanism involved in non-competitive. Okay. Um, anytime, enzyme repression, just dealing with stopping the enzyme production down the pathway, usually as feedback. Um, let's see. It's gonna talk a little bit about how that would work. So we have our DNA here. Now, let's start with one. Maybe that would be the smart thing to do. Let's start with one. DNA is transcribed into the RNA. We know RNA is then gonna be translated into the protein. Don't forget those terms. Um, that protein will then fold up into the enzyme and it is functional. Then that enzyme will work on its substrate to make its product. And then that product can even act on the DNA site itself, not with the enzyme necessarily, but at the DNA site to make the enzyme. So even going even further back. So still feedback, the um, mechanism and it's still repressing enzyme production or enzyme function, but just in a different way. Okay, so we can repress it either at the actual protein itself um, as non competitive inhibition, or we can repress it at the gene source. This is enzyme repression. That's the idea induction, um, we will make uh, our enzyme when we need it, basically. I don't know how else to describe that. Okay. Energy in the cells, we're going to have exergonic and endergonic reactions. Anything that releases energy, um, usually it's going to be breaking bonds. So this is usually catabolism. We're going to break bonds. We're going to release energy when we break those bonds. Endergonic reaction, you have to put energy into the reaction. So adding um, energy, usually in the form of ATP, but that's going to be anabolism. And that's going to be making or building bonds. Um, anytime you're building, we need energy. So you guys have probably heard of the term anabolic steroid. 
an anabolic steroid is called that because it's involving building and making new muscle tissue or building. So that's why it's anabolic. All right. Obviously. So if you know anything about body chemistry, you know that these guys are usually going to be coupled. Somewhere we had to make the energy in order to power the other one, right? And so, and if we use it up, then we're going to need to make more energy. So that's the idea of how this will be paired. So it shouldn't be too uh, foreign of a concept. So getting back into reduction and oxidation and redox pairs, we introduced this when we are talking about the enzymes. Now we're going to talk about how this is going to go forward in the cell as far as metabolism goes. Um, remember, redox reactions, you have the donor of the electron and the acceptor of the electron. And these are going to be uh, aided by oxidoreductases, which is enzymes involved in redox reactions. So I'm going to break this down for you. If there is any exchange or movement of electrons in the reaction, it's a redox reaction. Just think of it that way. Don't worry about too much beyond that, right? Because we're not going to break down these chemical pathways like down to like each and every molecule. If I need you to know a specific chemical reaction that's going on, because I mean, I'm saying this now, you guys will see what I mean. If you have not taken physiology, you don't know what I'm about to get into. Um, it's about to be the worst. If you hate chemistry, it's your worst nightmare about to come up. Um, this was the hardest thing for me to learn in biochem and I'm a biochem major. So just FYI, but I think it's cool if you understand the concepts and luckily that's all you need to know. So um, this is important reduction and oxidation for our coenzyme carriers that we mentioned earlier, NAD and FAD. It's like nicotinamide dehydrogenase and something. I don't know what, but you don't need to know it just if you're interested. So this is the example I gave earlier with our redox pairs. And I, I just need you to know reduction and oxidation. I don't need you to know reducing agent and oxidizing agent. This is the part I don't want you to focus on too much. If it loses an electron, right, Leo, that's oxidized. If it gains an electron, it's reduced. That's all you need to know. So this one gained its electron, it is reduced. This one lost an electron, so it is oxidized. That's why they have charges. All right, this is um, just giving you the picture of NAD reduction nicotinamide um, oxidized versus reduced. Now, I don't need you to know this chemical structure. Like I said, I'm just giving you the picture so you understand kind of what is happening every time I talk about NAD, All right? So if uh, I talk about NAD grabbing an electron, here is where the electron is, right? So we had it, double bond and single bond right here. We broke that bond, added in an electron and it is carried within that hydrogen that is bonded onto that carbon. Right? So that's not a proton hydrogen right there. Right there, it's a proper hydrogen that is exchanging its uh, electron into this molecule. So that's how this molecule is carrying that electron itself. However, as a result of this craft, it also carries this proton H plus, which is incredibly important. Both of these are important. The electron transport chain, which we're about to get into with aerobic respiration, relies on those two things, the electron and the proton that kind of come with it. Okay, they come as a pair in a way. You need both in order to make ATP. So we're going to learn how that is going to happen in everything, hopefully soon, because I'm getting sick of these boring things. Um, the, the, the electron transfer, we already know. We can remove hydrogens during dehydrogenation. D, hydrogen, go figure that would be removing hydrogens. I don't think that's a surprise. Uh, the job of handling protons that result and the electrons that are, were associated with the hydrogen, now that's the job of NAD or FAD, okay? So they're gonna be dealing with that. So we had dehydrogenase, now NAD and FAD are kind of basically like taking those electrons and the leftover protons and then carrying them onto the electron transport chain where they're going to be doing their business. So NAD is the most common one. We're going to see FAD as well. It'll become FADH. NAD is going to become NADH plus H. And I usually just say NADH and I just assume that you know that somewhere there was a proton. I'm not going to quiz you about the difference. Um, and if you're going through uh, photosynthesis, you'll have NADP which will become um, NADP with phosphate and then a hydrate NADPH, but that's not that good. So 
Let's get into the catabolic pathways. Um, that's gonna be important. This is breaking down bonds in order to get um, energy to drive our building later on, right? So we have two kinds. We have aerobic and we have anaerobic. These are familiar, yes? So aero, we already know that that means oxygen. So oxygen is used here. And the anaerobes, we already know that there's no oxygen here. So something else. Okay, so there's two options here. If you're aerobic, oxygen, final electron acceptor, okay? At the end of everything, when we have leftover electrons, and that's what I mean, the thing that helps clean that up is gonna be oxygen. You need it at the end. If you are anaerobic and you're making energy, you use something else. It doesn't matter what, you don't need to worry about that part of it. Anything else, not oxygen. All righty. Uh, ATP, this is our three-part molecule of adenine, a ribose sugar, not deoxyribose, ribose for ATP, ribose, three phosphate groups, ATP. So we'll be bound to that uh, ribose and all those phosphates are negative and they're gonna you know, push against one another, create strain in those bonds. And when you remove it, it's gonna release energy. Kind of seen this. This negative charge and this negative charge, especially very, very highly uh, energy rich. And they're going to push against one another and they want to break. So that when you break it, we can use that energy to drive everything. So that's the whole point of ATP. And like I've said, this is why you are alive right now. It's because your body is making enough of that. Without that, you die. That's why when I suffocate you, you die. And you're going to see why that makes sense in a moment. Um, so we need ATP. We can make it a few different ways. We can make it via substrate level phosphorylation. This just means we're moving a phosphate group from one molecule onto another. In this case, we're moving it from one molecule onto a DP diphosphate to make ATP triphosphate. That's all. It's that substrate level phosphorylation. We can also make it from oxidative phosphorylation. Um, we're going to have a bunch of redox reactions. This is going to be the that thing that I was talking about, the electron transport chain, the ETC. It's going to be that. And then we have um, photophosphorylation, which in case you haven't figured that out, guess where that's going to happen? That's going to be photosynthesis. So see, three ways you can make ATP. Three chemical reactions you can use to make it. Okay? Okay, so yeah, there's going to be three pathways we're going to talk about. Aerobic respiration, we already know that you're going to need oxygen for this. Proper true anaerobic respiration, or it's going to be anything else. And then fermentation, which is basically like using the first step called glycolysis over and over and over again. So I would say stunted pathway. Let me see what I mean. So there's three different ways you can make ATP. The least efficient of all of them by far is fermentation. The most efficient of them is gonna be aerobic respiration. All right, so we're gonna start off with breaking down glucose. Glucose is a sugar. Glyco, we know that that means sugar. Lysis means to break something down. That says what that does in that process in its name, okay? Breaking down a sugar. The sugar that we're going to be breaking down is going to be gly, uh, sorry, glucose. All right, so this is going to be a comparison between these. This is a great thing to come back to once you understand what each of these are and what's happening. But first, we have aerobic respiration. Second, over here, we have anaerobic. And third, over here, like I said, uh, it's fermentation. It's stunted. Clearly, there's less going on in the fermentation than there is in the other two. So what's the difference really between the first one and the second one? Uh, oxygen, and this is non-oxygen. That's the difference. So we can make 36 to 38 ATP here it's for all organisms ever alive. We make 36, bacteria make 38. That's because we have to get our stuff across the mitochondrial membrane. That's cost energy. So we lose ATPs there. Um, anyways, not too many, right? Just two, that's fine. I'm willing to do that. Uh, if you're anaerobic, depending on how you're getting there, you might only end up with two up to 36. 
And then fermentation, the most you're ever going to get is going to be two ATP. Sucks. But if you don't have any oxygen, it keeps you alive. So fermentation is done by things that are facultative anaerobes or aerotolerant, the ones that can handle being in oxygen. They can usually ferment as well. But um, they, these guys, can never use oxygen, whereas the facultative guys, remember that means you can switch. So if O2 is present, that means they're gonna go through aerobic. They can switch between. So that's a little bit better. I feel like that's like the best of the world, right? So you can do aerobic and then if you don't have oxygen, at least you can still survive. Okay. Um, so with aerobic respiration, we have a whole bunch of enzymes involved where we're going to be transferring electrons. Um, this is the main energy yielding thing that uh, aerobic heterotrophs are going to do. That includes us. And this provides ATP as well as metabolic intermediates for other pathways, like stuff to build new amino acids and new nucleotides and everything like that to keep you alive because you need to make new cells all the time. So let's start with glucose. We know this is a carbohydrate, it's a sugar. It is um, a good fuel because it's readily oxidized. Remember oxidized Leo, that's gonna be losing electrons. So it can donate electrons through this process. Um, yes, so excellent hydrogen and electron donors. If you're donating an electron in this process, like we showed with NADH plus H plus, right? The proton, you're always gonna be donating it with a proton. So if you get an electron, there's going to be a proton somewhere made also in this process, okay? Anyways, we're going to make electrons and we're going to make protons and then we use all of that to make ATP. That's the idea. So how does it work? I'm going to give you the words of it and I'm going to show you a picture of it. We're going to take glucose. Glucose is a six carbon sugar, yeah? Not anything crazy. It looks something along the lines of what we expect a six carbon sugar to look like. So we get that ring that we usually see with sugars. So it's six carbons. Um, and then we're gonna convert it through a whole bunch of steps into pyruvic acid. So this is glucose, pyruvic acid. And what kind of molecule is pyruvic acid? It is a three carbon molecule, okay? So go figure that you would be starting off with a six carbon glucose. You're gonna break it into two pyruvic acids at the, by the end. So you didn't lose any carbons or anything in this part. You're just getting to the two pyruvic acids. That's the goal of glycolysis. Glycolysis goal is pyruvic acid. That is it. That's the goal of it, all right? There's other stuff made. Like it says here, there is a small amount of ATP. That's just, we're trying to make use of what we can as we go, but that's not gonna sustain your life. That just happens to be something that happens along the way, okay? So pyruvic acid is the goal because we're gonna need it for the next step, which is, in case you weren't paying attention, is the Krebs cycle, the circle one, right? So we're gonna need it for that. Uh, but it also can be used as a building block for amino acids and for nucleotides. So it's a really useful molecule in your cell, okay? Pyruvate or pyruvic acid. This is what I was talking about. All right, you <laughs> see what I mean? I wanna show you. Here is glucose. They're just drawn out in a line so you can see all the carbons, all right? Here is pyruvic acid. Shall we go through the steps? I had to learn every step and I had to be able to draw the chemical reaction for everything that was happening in every single step in this. This is just glycolysis, y'all. We got glycolysis, then we got Krebs, then we got the electron transport chain. Buckle up, because this is gonna be a good time. No, seriously, I don't care if you know the stuff in the middle. Lucky you, all right? I definitely want you to know, glucose is a six carbon molecule that's getting broken into two, three carbon molecules of pyruvic acid. That is really all you need to know. I'm not going to test you on glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or anything else. The health, I care if you understand that. I don't care at all. Okay? I don't even care myself. 
But you, if you're interested, you can look through this and see how all of this is getting to pyruvate. That's what this is really just showing us, okay? I don't need you to know it's the stuff in the middle. There's all sorts of phosphates and crap happening. And even look here. We made this and this. Once we got into making these two guys here, sorry, which are already three carbon molecules, but we're not quite done with them yet. They go down their own little branches on each side and each one is gonna make some NADH and they're also gonna have what with them? Protons, right? So we've got NADH now suddenly, and I already told you we're gonna use that in electron transport chain. Keep holding on to that because we're coming to that. That electron transport chain isn't something small that I'm bringing up for no reason. It's the big whole purpose. Because I just told you we made like two ATP out of this, okay? I tell you to make two ATP uh, because this is all fermentation is. It's this over and over. That's why they only make two ATP, okay? Uh, you would make four, but you use up two in the process, okay? And it doesn't matter. But that is why fermentation is so inefficient. It's just this, because it can't go on to the other steps. But cool. So in aerobic respiration, because we're so, this is the picture of what we're going to get into next. Is this glycolysis? But they all have this, right? A aerobic, anaerobic fermentation, they all do glycolysis, okay? All right, let's talk about pyruvic acid. I don't need you to draw the structure of it, and I don't need you to recognize the structure of it. I just want you to recognize the name and know that it is a three carbon molecule. That's kind of important because we went from six to two threes. It adds up, it should make sense. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna be doing with that, we're gonna convert this BS into acetyl CoA. That's all the next step that matters, all right? This is just an intermediary step and isn't like uh, like the craziest thing that ever happens. But that acetyl-CoA, also known as acetyl-coenzyme A, which is what's short for, but acetyl-coenzyme A, uh, releases the first carbon dioxide molecule. We are kicking off one of those carbons from pyruvate, just taking it off. Now we're a two carbon molecule. Acetyl-CoA is two carbons, okay? So we kicked off one of those carbon dioxide molecules. This is the first part of, in all of this that we're seeing a loss of a carbon. And it comes out in the form of carbon dioxide. That's why you breathe out carbon dioxide right there, okay? All right, cool, so great. We also happen to make NADH, right, with our proton, it comes with it. That's important too. Something else we can throw into that electron transport chain. We're just gonna build those suckers up as we go. But that's the idea we had three carbon pyruvate now turning into two carbon acetyl CoA and kicking off some carbon dioxide and uh, you know electron carrier. Right next to the Krebs cycle. All right, you will go through the Krebs cycle twice for each glucose. Why? Because one glucose yielded you two pyruvate, so that's two acetyl CoA, so that's two Krebs cycle. Okay, so for the Krebs cycle. You will make NADH and FADH2. Again, important for the next step in the process. That is the point of the Krebs cycle, okay? The point of the Krebs is to get as many electrons as possible to the next step, which is the ETC, the electron transport chain. We do this in the form of NAD, sorry, NADH and FADH2. These are our electron carriers. So that the whole point is to get the electrons there, but another molecule has to carry them. That's our electron carriers, NADH, FADH2. That's the point of the Krebs cycle. All right, so hold on to your hats, y'all. This used to be called the citric acid cycle as well. And it's gonna talk about some stuff that I don't need you to care about also, let me see. So we will make the most carbon dioxide here because that's what we're doing. We're breaking as many bonds as we can and getting as many electrons out of it as we can and kicking out carbon dioxide as our waste product. So we start everything off with this crap, uh, oxaloacetic acid that's already going on 
in the cycle. Okay, we're not adding that. That's not our product from anything that was already there. Okay, it's going to interact with our acetyl CoA. Go figure. Here it is. Okay, so we had converted pyruvate to acetyl CoA. When you put acetyl CoA and the oxaloacetic acid, we get citric acid. That's why this is called the citric acid cycle. You don't need to know it. I did. I had to know it. <laughs> but so that's how this is going to work. That's where your acetyl CoA is going to go. And with all a bunch of chemical reactions in the cycle that you don't need to know, we're going to steal as many electrons as we can. And in the process, we're going to have carbon dioxide as waste that we won't need. Okay. We'll have stolen all the electrons we need out of it wherever we can. So here we have NADH and we get a proton with it. Here we have NADH and we get a proton with it. Here we have a little bit of ATP being made. That's substrate level phosphorylation. Here we have FADH2. Here we have NADH. Yeah, so this was before um, the Krebs cycle. That was acetyl-CoA. But yeah, so we have, uh, what is it? One, two, three, four, five. What five looks like? Uh, electron carriers in general from one pyruvate. And you get two pyruvates from the glucose. So 10 electron carriers just from the Krebs cycle. And that's all it is. You see how you regenerate um, oxaloacetic acid after going through this BS. So it's a very efficient cycle. We're just breaking down the two carbons. All you did was put in a two carbon molecule, really. So it's pretty efficient. It's great. That's the Krebs cycle, okay? Next is the electron transport chain. All right, this was the goal. This is the, this is the reason we're doing any of this, okay? This is a chain of like it's a special redox carriers. So we're leading with uh, proteins that are gonna interact with your electrons. Those proteins are gonna interact with electrons from the NADH and the FADH2 that you provided from the previous steps. You got some from glycolysis, you got some from turning pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, right? And then you got some from a lot from Krebs. So now we're taking all of that taking those electrons and putting them through special redox carrier proteins. And then that flow of the electrons through those proteins as they move from protein to protein allows for hydrogen ions, those protons, which I showed you earlier, those H pluses that we were building up to, those guys are gonna get pumped outside of the membrane because of that movement. They're not spending any ATP to build that gradient. So we're going against the normal gradient, right? We're trying to have an excess of hydrogens outside of the cell, but we're doing that without putting in energy. The cell figured out how to do that, okay? Because if you can build a gradient outside of the cell and later on use that energy from that gradient, then that's how we're gonna make ATP. Okay. That's the idea. Let me show pictures. Hopefully the pictures is next. Oh, this will help. Yes, okay. So here's your NADH. It's carrying the electron in the form of this guy. It also came along with uh, protons and stuff typically. So we've got a whole lot of protons that we're making up too. But the electron itself is gonna interact with these proteins. They're called cytochromes, these special proteins. Anyways, this guy is gonna kind of bounce around on these cytochromes and interact with them, cause them to change shape. And as they're doing it, we're gonna start accumulating all these protons outside of the membrane. You see here, we are talking about a gram positive bacterial cell. That cell wall, that thick peptidoglycan cell wall on the outside, we're building up protons between that and the membrane, outside of the membrane. Okay? If you are a person doing this, this is happening in your mitochondria along the cristae, the folds of your mitochondria, okay? not on the outside. And bacteria don't have that, right? So they have to do it on their own membrane on the outside. So that's what this is about. But we do it the same way. Anyways, um, we get all of these protons built up on the outside. Now we've got this crazy positively charged uh, proton gradient outside of the cell. The cell doesn't really care for that. They all want to come back in and equalize on both sides, of course, right? So what they do is they go through this channel and this channel, uh, this, this ground thing, they're going to go through this channel and this is ATP synthase and guess what it does? It makes ATP. So as we're moving these positively charged protons through this channel, it's causing that proton, the protein channel to interact with that positive charge. 
and that allows for phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. Okay, so we got ATP. For each like proton that you go through, is going to make an ATP. And it's great because at, um, you know that's easy enough to just to let things flow by diffusion. Yeah, yeah, and that's going to because the positive charges there allow for that phosphorylation. That is oxidative uh, phosphorylation because we moved all those electrons before we to, in order to do this, right? So this was driven entirely by moving the electrons, which created the proton uh, gradient, which is called the proton motive force, by the way, the proton motive force. And then that allows for ATP manufacture. Cool, that makes sense? Hope so, I hope so. So we're just, just triggering these proton proteins to allow us to pump hydrogens out and then they're going to fall back in to try to equalize the gradient um, through ATP synthase. That allows you to phosphorylate ADP to make ATP. Okay? This is what it looks like in our cells. It's just on the crystae, the folds of your mitochondria. All right, so we know here the important things are going to be ATP synthase. Um, it's going to be stationed along that whole association. It's going to release energy from the electron transport. It says ATS. It used to be called the electron transport system. I like chain better because that's how I learned it. Um, then oxidative phosphorylation, using all that electron BS to make ATP, coupling them together. That makes it oxidative phosphorylation. Remember, oxidative is just talking about moving our electrons through. That's all we're doing. So we have NADHs that we're carrying the electrons. Um, anyways, that allows us to make ATP. All right. As that electron transport uh, carrier, as the proteins in the whole chain move the electrons through, the hydrogen ions are pumped across. And this sets up that gradient we talked about. This is the saying. And that gradient is called the proton motive force. This whole thing, moving electrons and causing the protons to move as we're doing that because of the charges and the interaction with the proteins and everything like that through that thing, that's chemiosmosis. I mean, chemical osmosis, the chemicals are doing the osmosis, what it's saying. Chemiosmosis. Creating that proton motive force, we've got a lot of positive outside, so that means you're going to be negative comparatively on the inside. Um, so that's going to have potential energy, just like if you guys don't remember what potential energy is. If I have this pen and I hold it up here, there's a lot of potential energy, and I'm going to release it, that's potential energy. So physics tells you that it wants to do that naturally. And we're just harnessing that energy in this process. Instead of just letting it go to waste, we're actually going to use it to make ATP. Basically. So the cell can actually build other molecules. Here it is. Okay, <laughs> this is a big picture. Glycolysis, number one. Really, the whole point was pyruvates. That was the thing. Um, uh, we did make some water here and we did have uh, ATP made here, okay? Uh, the next step, two, Krebs. So we're going to put our acetyl-CoA, which we already changed it. Um, we're going to make carbon dioxide because we're stealing away all of those electrons in the form of these guys, right? And then we're going to shove those electrons through the electron transport system. And as we do that, make ATP as our product, okay? Um, that's the idea of how this is gonna work. The Probably one of the biggest things that I'm kind of leaving for the end because I feel like uh, it's important uh, to understand all of that before we get to it. You now moved all these rando electrons through all of this whole process. Let me see, is it in the next picture? Okay, yeah, it gets to it eventually. Um, so there's our yield, aerobic respiration, and it's yield. I don't care that you know every single number of how many carbon dioxides and waters and whatever. I would know when carbon dioxide is made. I would be aware of what steps you have carbon dioxide made. I need you to know how many, just know where you have it made, okay? Um, I'd be aware of where you're making those electron carriers. I don't need to know how many, just know where they're being made. Um, and then what the purpose is of each step. So glycolysis, glucose to pyruvates, to pyruvates, right? And that's gonna be made into 
that's teal coalesced. That's those are going to go through the Krebs cycle. Where the whole point of the Krebs cycle is to make those electron carriers. You got the electron carriers. They shove the electrons through the electron transport chain. As they do that, they pump the hydrogen ions out. Those protons create the positive on the outside, the negative on the inside. The positive wants to come back in. It goes through ATP synthase, and that powers ADP into ATP. That's aerobic respiration. This is something that took me like weeks to learn. So you're welcome. <laughs> so you guys don't have to learn all of the details. I know this seems like a lot now, but like there's a lot that I'm leaving out. So um, our terminal step, right? Our terminal step, you, I keep telling you guys that we need oxygen at the end, that it's our final electron acceptor. But th I haven't told you about how or why or what that's about yet. Remember how we moved all of those electrons through those proteins and that helped us move the protons out, right? Create that gradient, positives. Those electrons, as they move through, they have to go somewhere. They can't just disappear into the ether, right? We have to take care of those. So in cytochrome C, which is the last of those weird proteins before you get to the ATP synthase, in cytochrome C, those electrons at the end are going to meet up with some of the protons that moved through inside. So we got the protons that came back in. You can't have those charges equaling out on those two sides. If that happens, you're not going to make ATP. So you have to start getting rid of the protons too. So you take the electrons and the protons that came back in and you take half of a water molecule. That means you've got H plus H plus, now become H, H with an O. That's H2O, okay? That's where your oxygen goes when you breathe in. 100% of it goes to that. That's why you have to keep breathing because you literally have to make that much ATP all the time. Pretty crazy. So now you guys know why you breathe in oxygen. You also learned why you breathe out carbon dioxide. Now you know why when I tell you guys the carbon dioxide didn't come from the oxygen that you breathed in. Related process, but that oxygen is not the same oxygen, right? So we've learned that too. We know that the carbon dioxide came from glucose. So it's pretty cool stuff. I hope you guys think it's cool too. Anyways, anaerobic respiration. Again, I don't need you guys to remember what they can use for instead of oxygen, but they can use other things. That's anaerobic respiration. All right, they can use nitrate, nitrite, sulfur-based crap. Who cares? It's not oxygen. That's the point. Fermentation, you just stay in that glycolysis set. Uh, you only get two ATP out of that. As a result, you do have some electron acceptors there because there are, is electron exchange. So they have to deal with those somehow. Bacteria have different ways of dealing with that. And depending on what bacteria you are, you may make acid, like lactic acid. You may make alcohol. You may make carbon dioxide as a gas byproduct. There's other things, in other ways, and other combinations that they can deal with that to get rid of it. But this is just kind of bringing that up. You've got your pyruvate. You can use it to build things up, but you also need to get rid of the electron that you carried around here. Because that's not going through the normal electron transport chain. So anyways, uh, yeah, so there's all sorts of different ways. It could go lactic acid or ethanol or acetaldehyde, whatever. That's the point is that it's clearly not using oxygen. Um, da, 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 da. There's all different kinds of fermentation, which we're gonna talk about uh, in the lab when we get to Vogue's Pro Scour and mixed acid fermentation, but basically having lactic acid only, that's homolactic fermentation, I mean, I'll be, and then heterolactic fermentation, different kinds of acids are made. And then other byproducts as well, like carbon dioxide. That's all that I was talking about. Um, then the proper mixed acid fermentation, sometimes they have other kinds of acid too. I don't, there you go. That's all I need you to know. Other acids, I don't need you to know what they are. Um, you can break apart lipids for, for energy and enter into this, right? Break it into parts and enter into certain aspects of this whole entire process um, with, that uh, with a six carbon fatty acid, just a six carbon fatty acid, which most of the fatty acids are not six carbon, right? There are a lot more carbons than that. Six carbon fatty acid yields 50 ATP compared to the six carbon sugar, which is 38. That's why your body stores energy as fat, literally why? Because it's, it's so high energy. It's more high energy than anything else. So yeah, it takes energy to get energy out of protein. That's why you know, uh, they talk about keto and everything like that, okay? Getting your body to work for its energy. Anyways, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. No, I know I'm done. I just need to get knock out this last little bit. 
Um, da, 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 da. Proteases are just breaking down proteins, make amino acids. Amphibolism is just dealing with both of those pathways, the catabolic and the anabolic, working together and getting intermediates and pulling the pyruvate out to make amino acids or whatever else. Okay, all of them, how they all mix together. Um, and obviously you need all of these components to make parts of the cell. If you don't know that by now, I don't know what to tell you. Oh shit, I forgot about photosynthesis. Okay, real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about the plants. Okay, the, we have two kinds of reactions in plants. They're actually pretty cool. This part's cool, okay? There's two kinds of reactions in plants, the light dependent and the light independent, okay? The light dependent, the part that you need actual sunlight for is catabolic. We're making energy there. Guess what kind of energy we're making there? ATP, right? Just a little bit, okay? Then we have the light independent reactions. We're using that ATP, that little bit we made, to turn carbon dioxide into organic molecules, okay? Uh, right, so light reactions, we're just making ATP from the sun, just harnessing that through those, um, what is it, the pigments, that's what it's called. The pigments get excited, then we move our little electrons down, and we get our little ATP, and isn't it nice and happy? We get a little bit of ATP from photosynthesis, use that ATP in the Calvin cycle, which is the dark cycle. Don't confuse it with the Krebs cycle. Okay? The Calvin cycle is the dark cycle. We're going to make glucose here. Right, so we used our little bit of ATP in the sunlight to make glucose. We don't need sun for this. It can't happen in sunlight. We don't need it here. Um, and guess what? There. Guess what we're going to do with that glucose? Right, aerobic respiration. Yeah, to get real energy out of this. So they're just taking inorganic carbon dioxide and energy from the sun to make their own glucose and then shove it through the electron transport chain. That is. They're cool. They're better than us at this, I feel like, right? They don't need quite as much energy, though. Um, obviously, oxygenic photosynthesis is the one that you get oxygen as the product. There's other kinds of photosynthesis, and that's it. There's your picture. Whew, for, sorry, I forgot about the plants. That means I've been taking longer with the other ones. I don't know what it is. You guys think I take a long time here. I always take longer with every other class after you. So what's step with step with CO2 made? Uh, what simple step is CO2 made? Yeah. What? I mean, we have CO2 made when we convert pyruvate into acetyl CoA. That's pretty simple. So the Krebs cycle? Well, right before the Krebs cycle. So that is literally pyruvate to acetyl CoA is a step on its own, it's just one step right before Krebs. And then in Krebs, we make a ton of carbon dioxide there. But the simpler one, I think, would be the one before it. I don't know. I don't worry about it. We're not even using it. We're not using those today. Oh, oh okay. I said for this week, and like originally before things shifted from the snowstorm, so, it would have been today, but we're not. It's not today. What are your cars? Uh, you can usually. I think they're posted on the syllabus on uh, yeah, Canvas. Yeah, 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 if you want to look at that. Yeah. But uh, otherwise, yeah. it'll be after I finish with my second lab today. So 2 30 to 4 30 today. Yeah, and then, yeah, because, and then Tuesdays and Thursdays, I have one to four. Oh, that actually might work better. I Whenever, have, yeah. Okay. I'll be but there. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. um, the sheets that you need to sleep on, is that for today's lab or Wednesday? It'll be Wednesday, yeah. Okay. Because we had to move it a day. Yeah.